looking at John chapter 1 today. If you turn to John chapter 1, let's read his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus, and we ask you, Lord, to speak to us through your word. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see the truth that you have for us today. May Jesus be exalted, Lord. We come before you this Christmas season and just know, Lord, that you have called us to be your light. Lord, give us that boldness to be able to share the hope that we have in Jesus with those around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. If you agree, we say amen. Amen. In December 1903, after many, many attempts, the Wright brothers were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground. They were so excited, they telegraphed this message to their, to their sister, Catherine. They said, we have actually flown 120 feet. We will be home for Christmas. So Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper and showed him the message. And he glanced at it and he said, how nice, the boys will be home for Christmas. He absolutely, totally missed the big news that men had actually flown. And here's a picture of the Wright brothers flying that first plane off the side of a hill. Do you know, I think that's the way it is for Christmas. There's so many people all around the world that totally miss it when it comes to Christmas. People celebrate Christmas around the world and they don't think of Jesus and his miraculous birth. They think of family, they think of gatherings, they think of meals and decorations. How many of you are going to have a family gathering for Christmas? Yeah, many, many of you. They think of Santa. We see so many people all into elves. We didn't have the elf on a shelf when I was a kid. I don't know what that would have looked like, but people are putting elves all over the place. Think about gifts. How many of you still have to buy a gift for somebody? Yeah, most of you are doing really, really good then, or you're just not going to give a gift to anybody, and that could be really bad. Uh, but all of that is fun, but it's not at the heart of what Christmas is all about. Two weeks ago, we looked at Christmas from the Gospel of Luke. Gabriel came to Mary, and this is what he said. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So here's two things that we see about the Lord. First of all, he will be the Son and this speaks of his earthly nature. Jesus is going to be fully human. And it also says he's the son of God. This points to his heavenly origin. He's not just the son of Joseph or any other earthly man. He's the son of God. So last week we looked at Christmas from the Gospel of Matthew. And the angel came to Joseph. And the angel said this, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary to be your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the angel directed Joseph, and he directed Mary to name this baby boy Eusus. Yeshua is the Old Testament name. It's from Joshua, and it means Jehovah saves, Yahweh saves. You know, names are so important. I remember for every one of our children when they were born, we bought a baby book and started to look through every single name in the baby book, trying to figure out a name for our children. Did anybody else do that? And I remember when we were getting ready to have our son, I was looking through the baby book to find a name of a, of a, of a, of a child. And you know what happened? Jill had already told me that God had put it in her heart. We we're going to have a boy and we're going to name his name Caleb. And I was like, okay, that makes it easy for me. I don't have to think about what the name is going to be. Uh, God put it on her heart that, it, that his name was going to be Caleb. Can you imagine the moment that Joseph and Mary got together and they began to talk to each other and tell their stories to each other? They both were told by an angel that Mary was going to have a baby. But think about this. The angel of the Lord told Joseph, you're going to call this baby, you're going to call him Isis. You're going to call him Jesus. And Gabriel told Mary the exact same thing. You're going to have a baby, and you're going to call him 
Jesus. Can you imagine when they got together and they began to tell their stories with each other and both of them were able to tell each other, an angel told me to name him Jesus. Well, an angel told me also the exact same thing, to name him Jesus. They knew that God was at work in this baby's life. Amen? So Mary was told and Joseph was told that you're going to have this baby, you're going to name him Jesus. But Mary was told something that Joseph was not told according to the scriptures. Mary was told by Gabriel that the Lord will give to this baby the throne of his father David and he will reign forever. Now I want you to know that Joseph knew what his family lineage was. In Matthew chapter 1 we see the genealogy given to us that Jesus was born from a lineage that began with Adam and went all the way through David and then finally it came through Joseph and then to Jesus. They were going to go to Bethlehem because that was the home of David, their family ancestor. And so can you imagine what Joseph must have thought? He knew that he was a descendant, a direct descendant to King David. And now here is Mary probably telling him, I was told by Gabriel that this baby is going to reign in the throne of his father, David. He is going to reign forever. At that moment, David, excuse me, at that moment, Joseph realized this baby that Mary has is from God. But here's what Mary's telling me, that an angel told her that this baby is going to take over the throne of King David. What he must have thought of. You know, the whole world attempts to make Jesus one more holy man among many others throughout history. They try to marginalize Jesus. They try to remove his glory. But we know that Jesus is the son of David. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is Isis, the son of God, and his kingdom will never, ever end. Some anonymous author wrote this years ago. More than 1,900 years ago, there was a man born contrary to the laws of nature. The man lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. Only once did he ever cross the boundary of the country in which he lived. That was during his exile in childhood. In infancy, he startled the king. In childhood, he puzzled the theologians. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the waves as if on pavement and hushed the sea to sleep. He never wrote a book, and yet there are more books written about him than all the books of any subject that have ever been written. He never wrote a song, and yet he has furnished themes for more songs than all the songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together cannot boast of having as many students. Though time has spread many years between the people of this generation and the scene of his crucifixion, yet he still lives. Herod could not destroy him. The grave could not hold him. He stands forth upon the highest pinnacles of heavenly glory, proclaimed by God, acknowledged by angels, adored by saints, and feared by the devils as the living personal Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our God, Amen. Hallelujah. There is nobody like Jesus. Christianity is not a philosophy. It's a person. Christianity is not a religion. It is a person. Christianity is not a creed. It is a person. Christianity is about a relationship with Isis, the Son of God. Now I want you to look with me at the opening words of the book of John. We looked at the book of Luke. We looked at the book of Ma uh, Matthew last week, and today we're going to look at the book of John. John was probably the last gospel that was ever written. John filled in the gaps of what Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not cover. Matthew, Mark, and Luke is called the synoptic gospels. I want you to see this. It says the synoptic gospels, the word sin and optic, sin for synthesis. And so what the Gospels are, you've heard this term, the synoptic Gospels. It means they see together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are seeing together. And the reason why we call them the synoptic Gospels is because Mark was written first. And 90% of Mark, word for word, is in the book of Matthew. It's as if Matthew took the book of Mark and then he filled in all around it the things that he remembered. 50% of Mark, over 50% of Mark is word for word in the book of Luke. But John sets himself apart. He focuses on a different 
area of ministry of the Lord Jesus, and he also focuses on not just the teachings of Jesus, but he begins to focus on who Jesus is. And we see that in John chapter 1. John begins his gospel with a different type of Christmas story. It's not about the sheep and the shepherds and the wise men and the angels singing in the sky. He begins his Christmas story from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. You know how the Bible begins, right? It begins and it says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the beginning of the revelation of Almighty God and creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But look what John says in his gospel as he begins. He says, in the beginning, he's taking those exact same words. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John is wanting us to know from the very first words that he pens on his gospel, he is wanting to know, he was wanting every one of us to know unequivocally exactly who this baby is when he was born. This is the ultimate self-revelation of God. John is telling us God became flesh. A prophet is God's messenger, but Jesus is God's Messiah. A prophet was God's spokesman. But Jesus is God's son. From the prophet, we hear the voice of God. But in Jesus, we see God. And look what he says down in verse 14. It's a very powerful moment. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So what does John tell us about this Christmas baby? The very first thing he tells us is that Jesus himself has the power of God. Jesus has unsurpassed, unequaled, and unparalleled power. He says all things that were made, look around, everything that you see was made through him. And without Jesus, there was not anything that you can see that was made. I want you to know I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said, let there be light, and bang, there was light. Evolution, I want you to know this. Regardless of what scientists say, evolution is a theory. It is not science. Science is based on facts of what is observable and what is verifiable. And no one was there to observe creation. Evolution has a presupposition. There is no God. That's the presupposition of evolution. There is no God. So therefore, if there is no God, then what can we come up with to explain the creation that is around us? If there is no God, how and where did all of creation come from? I want you to see this quote, Edwin Conklin. He's a professor at Princeton. He's a biologist, and this is what he said. He said, the probability of life originating from an accident is comparable to the probability of the unabridged dictionary resulting from an explosion in a printing company. The order, the magnificence, the beauty that we have of creation, the intricacies that we have in creation came from some cosmic blast that happened millions and millions and millions of years ago. I think it'd be easier just to believe that there is a God, amen? Almighty God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, it was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit who was creating the universe. And John tells us that Jesus has God's power. Jesus has the power of creation. That's why everybody wants to do everything they can to try to look back through history and say, oh, you know what, they made that stuff up. There's no miracles. There's no miraculous Jesus didn't really do the things that he claimed to have done or that the writers claimed that he had done. What are they trying to do when they try to disprove miracles? They're trying to say that Jesus was not who John says he is and Matthew says he is and Luke says he is and who Mark says he is and who the empty grave says he is, that Jesus is Almighty God. He had the power of creation. 
And we see this power in his life and in his ministry. He had power over disaster. In the middle of a raging storm, he could speak to the sea and say, peace, be still, and the waves would lie down at his feet. He had power over demons. He could say to a demonically possessed man, come out of him, bam, and immediately demons would flee. I want you to know this. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel like you have the demonic closing in, or you feel like there's an oppression, or you feel like there's a darkness, and you don't know what to do, I'm going to tell you right now, this is exactly what you do. You open up your mouth, and you just say, Jesus. In fact, say it right now. Jesus. The demons in the spiritual realm, they don't even like the name of the word, Jesus. Just say, Jesus, and it'll be gone. There's power. How many of you know that there's power in the name of Jesus? He had power over disease. He had power over disease. There are many people that claim that they can, they can call out and pray for healing. We ask for healing all the time. I'm not afraid to anoint somebody with oil, as the Bible says, and pray that God heals them. Sometimes God intervenes and heals, and sometimes he doesn't. But all healing, no matter who prays for it, all healing comes from the power of Almighty God, not from the touch of a man. And Jesus was God in the flesh. And Jesus could heal Immediately, he would walk up to a leper and touch them, and the leprosy would just vanish. Jesus had power over death, not just once, not just twice. Several times we see Jesus raising the dead. He would speak over a girl, and she would just rise up from her dead death like she was asleep, and she'd just come right out of it. He stood at the tomb of his friend and said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, he comes out of the grave. I love this story. One of my The favorite story for me of Jesus raising somebody from the dead is found in Luke chapter 7. He's entering into the village of Nain to preach and to teach the gospel of the kingdom and to call people to repent. And as he's walking into the village, guess what? There's a funeral procession that's coming out of the village. The only son of a widow is walking out with their friends and family members. Her only son is on a funeral pier. They're carrying the body out of the out of the village to lay him down somewhere and to bury him. And as Jesus is walking in, and as the procession, the funeral procession is coming out, Jesus stops and he says, do not weep. He looks at the dead body of this little boy and he says, young man, I say to you, arise. Man, Jesus knows how to break up a funeral, doesn't he? Hallelujah, give him praise. Jesus has power over depravity. He could say to the very worst sinner, the very worst sinner, all he would do is look at them and say, your sins are forgiven. And they were forgiven. The religious leaders were astounded by that. How could you speak to this woman and tell her her sins are forgiven? How could you speak to this man who's lame and laying down and crippled? How could you just tell him that your sins are forgiven? Who are you to say your sins are forgiven? One time he did that, and the Pharisees came up to him and said, who are you? What authority do you have to say your sins are forgiven? And Jesus said, yes, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven, but so that you may know that I am from God. He looked at the man and said, crippled, get up and walk. And immediately the man, not only was his sins forgiven, but his body was totally healed. There is nobody like Jesus. Jesus has the power of God. He did what only God could do. Why? Because he is, as the gospel John wrote, he is the son of God. So if you need power in your life, anybody need power in their life, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Call out to Jesus. So what does John tell us about this Christmas baby? Jesus has the power of God. He created absolutely everything. But not only does Jesus have the power of God, John tells us that this baby is God in the person. He is God in the person. Jesus is God in person. Don't don't get that wrong. This is where Christianity divides with every single other person in this world in a sense of either you believe that Jesus is God or you don't believe he's Jesus is God. All throughout history, you make two mistakes when it comes to Jesus. You either say that he wasn't really a man. He was just some God being. People have made mistakes there. Or you look back and say, oh, Jesus was just a man. He might have had something amazing happen to him. He might have had some God spirit come upon him. There have been people that have erred in this way throughout history. 
But Jesus is not just a man. Jesus is God in the flesh. And John makes that very, very clear. In Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created. In John chapter 1, here's what John says, the word was God, and God became flesh and dwelt among us. Christmas is all about lights, isn't it? Lights are everywhere. How many of you have put up Christmas lights? We did Christmas lights earlier than we ever had this year because I'm thinking about winter, and I don't know about you, but I hate the cold. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. It could be hot, and I'm fine, but when it gets cold like this, it's crazy, isn't it? Anybody else, anybody else like that? And so when it got to be really warm, I'm like, let's go put out the lights. Let's, let's do everything now. Christmas is all about lights, right? Isn't it beautiful, the lights that we have in here? I was talking to Baba the other day about lights, and he had gotten a Christmas tree that some friend had given to him, but half the lights didn't work. So he said he spent all night long because his daughter was insistent, we've got to get the tree up, Dad, we've got to get the tree up. And Baba said, I, well, it was a Tuesday at our staff meeting, he was just sitting there about half dead, and we're all looking at him like, what's wrong, Baba? Did you stay up all night praying? No, he didn't stay up all night praying. He stayed up all night. He said, going intricately through this tree that was given to him, tearing out all the lights out of that tree that did not work. And we're like, why'd you do that? Just wrap lights around it that do work, right? Christmas is all about lights. But you have, you have first of all, you have the bulb, right? But then when that light is functioning right from the bulb emanates light. The light doesn't exist by itself. It has to emanate from the bulb, right? And what we see in scriptures, look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, speaking of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. The light emanates from the bulb. Jesus emanates from God. He is the glory. That's why John at one point says, we beheld his glory. We touched his glory. What is the glory? Glory doesn't exist by itself. Glory emanates from deity, from God himself. Jesus is the emanation of almighty God. John chapter 10, Jesus said this, I and the Father are one. That got him in trouble. In fact, that was one of the main accusations against Jesus. You're a blasphemer. His Hebrew brothers, his Hebrew theologians, the Hebrew priests, those who were in charge of the temple, this is the one thing that they could not accept about Jesus, and it's the one thing that so many people all across this world still can't accept about Jesus. They'll accept Jesus as a rabbi. They'll accept Jesus as a teacher. They'll accept Jesus as a philosopher. But is Jesus God? If Jesus is God, then that means that Jesus is exalted above any philosophy, any religion, any person, anybody that's ever lived, anybody that's ever breathed their life. If Jesus is God, then there is none greater than him. And what do we say to that? Amen. Hallelujah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So here's what, here's what the, 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 the people said in Jesus' day. You keep making yourself out to be God. In fact, when they brought Jesus before the high priest, the high priest looked straight at him and said, are you the Christ? And Jesus finally opened his mouth and said, as you say, it is so. They beat him. They immediately punched him. They wouldn't accept what he said. And then after they punched him and beat him, he said, from this day forward, you're going to see me standing at the right hand of God. They tore their clothes. They would not accept the truth that Jesus is really the word that became flesh. And they drug him outside of the city. They put him on a tree. And he didn't die for his sins. He was the Lamb of God. He came to die for all of our sins. And now he is a name that is above every name. And his name is what? Jesus. That's right. Well, Jesus, I've heard, I get tickled by these guys that go back through history and they say, well, Jesus didn't really claim to be God. Sometimes these guys will come knocking on your doors, the Jehovah Witnesses, right, who just totally just butchered the, the word. Their, their, their founder, Russell, he butchered the word. In John chapter 1, verse 1, if you get a New World Translation Bible, it'll say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and then they add, and the word was, and they put a little word A and a little G, G-O-D. Years ago when I was in seminary, I was able to go and do some, some uh, studies of, a, of different religions, and one of the things that we did is we went into, a, uh, we went into the um, Jehovah Witnesses Hall, and I looked at all the books that were on their shelf, and they had a Greek lexicon. 
So I bought the Jehovah Witnesses Greek lexicon. I pull it open. I'm curious about it after I got home, and I look at it, and I'm like, in the Greek, they have it right. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The A, the preposition A, the Greek, it's not there in their own Greek lexicon. But in their translation, they add that in there. People throughout all history have stumbled over this issue. Is Jesus God, or is he just a godly person? I've heard people say, well, Jesus himself, he didn't claim to be God. I tell you that is so totally not true. John chapter 14, I love this interchange. Philip, Philip comes in. Go read this this afternoon. Philip comes and says, show us the Father. And look what Jesus says. Have I been with you so long? Have I been with you so long? And you still don't know me. Whoever has seen me has seen who? That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? That's pretty radical. That is absolutely radical. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian philosopher, the great Christian apologetic, wrote wonderful, wonderful books about the faith. He didn't come into Christianity just with eyes wide open. He came into Christianity as a skeptic. But once he came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he wrote some amazing books that are what's called apologetic books about why we can believe in Christianity. If you haven't read his books, start with the book Mere Christianity. Start with that, M-E-R-E, Mere Christianity. And he was the one that said, when you look at Jesus, you cannot accept Jesus as just a teacher. You cannot accept Jesus as just a philosopher because some of the things he said are outlandish. You can't take him for just being a, a great teacher because he was either a liar because some of the things he said are just outright crazy. And this is one of those instances when Jesus looks at his followers and says, if you see me, you see Jehovah. That's what he's saying. If you see me, you see Jehovah. Who is the father? He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Isaac. And here's Jesus looking at these Jewish men and says, if you see me, you see the Father. Is he lying? Or C.S. Lewis said he's a lunatic. What man, what human man would say, I am God? What human man would look at somebody else and say, when you see me, <coughs> you're seeing the Father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That's what C.S. Lewis said. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he is the Lord. And after a close examination of his life, we and two billion other people on the, place of the, on the face of this planet say that Jesus is the Lord. If you want to know what God is like, all you have to do is look at Jesus. If you want to know how God would act, all you have to do is look at Jesus. If you want to know what God would say here on earth, all you have to do is listen to Jesus. This is why reading the Bible is so important for you to read the Bible every single day. John tells us this Christmas baby has the power of God, that this Christmas baby is none other than God. So the question is, why? Why was the Son of God born that first Christmas? I want you to remember the angel told Joseph and Mary, name him Esus. Name him the same name that we say, Joshua. It's the name that means Yahweh saves. He will save his people from their sins. That's what the angel told Joseph about this boy. Jesus came to destroy sin. And the people who will experience the fullest meaning of Christmas next Sunday are going to be the people who know that Jesus came to save them from their sin. What did he come to save us from? He came to save us from our sins. John, in that very first chapter, he gives us a little rundown of, first of all, the apostle, uh, the follower of Jesus, John the Baptist. And why does John know John the Baptist? Because that's where he started out as. John was the first disciple, one of the first disciples of John the Baptist. And so, first of all, John is following John the Baptist. And John tells us that John the Baptist came, and he was speaking about this Messiah that's going to come. And then John says at one point, one day, when John the Baptist was baptizing, he was teaching, he was preparing people for the Messiah, all of a sudden Jesus came. Look down there at chapter 1, verse 29. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, 
John the Baptist immediately stopped, looked at him, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Takes away. That's why Jesus came. He came to take away sin. What is sin? Sin is disobedience to God. It's rebellion against God. Later on, John wrote not only the gospel, he wrote the epistles, these letters to the churches. 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, look what Jesus says. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Why did Jesus come? Look what John tells us. The reason the Son of God appeared. The reason the Son of God came. The reason the Son of God was born. The reason why we have that very first Christmas is because Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came on a, miss, on a mission to destroy. And what did he destroy? He came to destroy sin. And all through the New Testament, you see Jesus with this clear picture that humanity, we are either sons of God or we are sons of the devil. We are sons of righteousness or we are sons of sin. We are going to follow Jesus who's come to pay for our sins or are we going to follow our own wishes and our own whims. As the Lamb of God on the cross, Jesus shed his blood and purified us from our sins. He has given us his power. And if you receive him, you have the right, the authority to be called a son of God or a daughter of God. I don't know if you saw this. I was watching the news yesterday. I got so mad, I just turned off the TV. Have you ever done that? Just get so mad, you just turn off the TV? So there's this place in Virginia that a satanic club was trying very hard to become an after-school program at a grade school. The satanic club wanted to have an after-school program. And so after I got mad and angry about it, I kind of went on the internet and kind of looked about it. So there's this satanic group that is trying across America to try to have access to schools and start after-school clubs for, say, for, for the, it's a Satan club. They're trying to do this. Does that make anybody else mad? Oh, this side of the church is. Are you guys awake? So I start, I start thinking about that. But on, before I got mad and turned it off, the guy was saying, well, these are the things that we're teaching kids. And I can't remember all of them, but one of them came across, and it was, a, it was a bullet on the screen, on the TV screen. And one of them that came across that I can remember is this. One of the things that they wanted to teach kids is they wanted to teach kids the, the, the authority of self. The authority of self. And that, that's Satan from the very beginning, isn't it? The, the authority of self that I don't have to obey anybody. I don't have to follow anybody. Isn't that what he did to Adam and Eve at the very beginning? That's how sin entered, entered to the world. God said, here's some standards. Follow them. And Adam and Eve were fine as they were following God's prescription for what life was supposed to be, right? Then all of a sudden, a serpent, the devil comes, says, what did God tell you to do? And what's the very first thing that we have coming out of the devil's mouth from the very beginning? You don't have to do that. God said it, you don't have to do it. God said it, but it's not true. God said it, but it's not going to happen that way. God said that, but you don't have to follow that. The sovereignty of self. That's what the satanic club wanted to teach people. The sovereignty of self. The sovereignty of self. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? Sovereignty of self. I should have my own sovereignty. But the problem with that is I didn't give myself life. I didn't give myself breath. And if all, of I, if all I want is the sovereignty of myself, guess what? You can have that. In this life that you have, whether you live five years, whether you live 100 years, whether you live between five years and 100 years, you can have all the sovereignty of yourself that you want. But if you want to have eternal life, if you, want to, if you want to bask in the privilege of having life forever, because that's what God wants us to have, then you've got to understand, there is not sovereignty of self. There is sovereignty of the Son of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And every one of us have a problem, and it's sin. And that's, that's, that's where we're at right now. 
We've gotten to a place where we just want to stamp, bop, outdate it. Nobody has a sin problem. There's no, there's no problem with sin. There's no accountability. Nobody has to be accountable for sin. There's no problem with sin. In fact, let's just get away with the title sin, the name sin. That sounds, that sounds bad. You know, there's no sin. Nobody's a, nobody is a sinner. And the problem with that is, is when I get done with my life and you get done with your life, we're not going to stand before a court of our peers. We're going to stand before a heavenly court of God Almighty. And when we stand before that court, what we're told is one of two things are going to happen. One, we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our sovereign Savior, who was born that Christmas day. The one who made everything there is became flesh and dwelt among us. And John tells us at the very end of his epistle, he says, all of these things that I've written to you, I want you to see this, John chapter 20, verse 31. After everything that he writes, is he telling us about Jesus, the seven I am's of Jesus, the seven miracles that he tells us of a Jesus. From the very first chapter, verse 1, the creator was born, the creator is flesh. And then he goes through his entire gospel. He's the creator because of this miracle. He's the creator because of this miracle. He's the creator because of this miracle. Seven miracles he highlights. The seven great I am's. He's the creator because he says, I am the bread of life. I am the true light. I am the door. On and on he goes. But then at the very end, as he makes this, this epistle given to us to help us to know who Jesus is, this is the last thing he says. These things are written to you so that you may what? Would you all say that again one more time? Believe that Jesus is the Christos the Christ, the son, not the son of Joseph, not the son of any other human being. He is the son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let me tell you about a young man I met while our worship team comes. I was preaching in seminary. I was preaching a revival in southern Virginia. Met this guy. I'll never forget his name. His name is Vu Lee. Vu Lee was in a Vietnamese refugee camp in Cambodia when he was a little boy before coming to America. He spent several years of his life there. Sickness came upon the refugee camp, and people were dying all around him. And then he got sick, and he was so scared. And this is in a church in southern uh, Virginia, and it was after the church service. We had a fellowship afterwards, and I got to see Vu and Obviously, at that time, back in 1990s in southern Virginia, seeing a Vietnamese man in a church service, I began to talk to him and ask him, and I asked him how he got saved, how he came to know Jesus. And he told me he got sick, and he was scared. And while he was sick, while he had scared, he had a dream. And in the dream, he was told in the dream by, he says he knows now, an angel, but at that time, he didn't know what it was, but it's just some majestic being in his dream told him to go to the tent where the Christian relief workers were. So after he woke up the next day, he said he did that. He got up, he went to the edge of the camp, and he went to the tent where the Christian workers were at, and they prayed for him in the name of Jesus. And he said, Jesus immediately healed him. And because of that, he gave his life to Jesus. He gave his life to Christ Jesus. He came to the point to believe that life is found in who? It's found in Jesus. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Christmas is going to have so much meaning for us, isn't it? Because we worship the one who gives us life and life everlasting. So don't be afraid to invite somebody to church next Christmas Eve. We're all going to be at Soulard celebrating. Next Christmas Day, uh, we're going to be worshiping here at 930. And uh, invite somebody to church. You will not get tackled. If somebody gets tackled, somebody comes to me next week and says, Pastor, I invited somebody to church and they tackled me. I'm going to be like, okay, all right. Let's bow our heads as we pray. You may be here today, and you have never came to that place. John says, I've written this so that you may believe that Jesus is Christos. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. The Bible says what you need to do is receive him. 
Jesus never tells us go on a pilgrimage, try to earn your righteousness, try to, from this point on, to do everything you possibly can do to be good, and then at the end, maybe you'll earn your way into heaven. There's nobody that earns their way to salvation. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. All you have to do is believe on him and start following him. Believe on him right now and then spend the rest of your life just following him. If you've never made that decision right now, just pray, Lord Jesus, I believe in you and I want to follow you. I thank you for making yourself known to me. Listen, for us as Christians, I told you this is not a religion. This is not a creed. This is not a philosophy. It's a person, Jesus. He's alive. Maybe you need power in your life. Maybe you need power to get over an addiction. And I know people in this room right now, God has helped them with his power to get over some terrible things. Amen. God has power for you. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a memory. Maybe it's unforgiveness. You're struggling with forgiving somebody. Maybe it's loneliness. I don't know what it is, but there is power to be had in the Lord Jesus. And what we celebrate here every Sunday is not empty, is it? It's not empty. Jesus is alive. He wants to bless you. The Lord tells us there is just absolute power in cooperative prayer. When we pray for each other, we pray with each other. Jill and I will be here to pray with you as we worship the Lord, even right after the service. You've got something you want us to pray for you about. We want to do that. The most important thing about this Christmas is to understand that God loved us so much. He came to make himself known to us. People search for God in so many different ways. People search for him. Try to find God. Try to find him. So many different pursuits. But the Lord has already made himself known. All you have to do is come to him. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you glory this day. May Jesus be exalted in our worship. And Lord, we pray that among all of us among our friends, our family members, people that we come into contact with, Lord, let us see uh, this Christmas season. People come to know you, believe in you. Let their eyes be opened, Lord. That's the reason why you came, so that people could find what life really means, find what peace really means, to experience the power of forgiveness, Lord. Lord, let that story flow through us to others around us. Lord, let us not be able to hold it in. Lord, we have the answers to the problems that so many people are walking through day by day. Lord, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we worship the Lord today.